Hi. <laughs> nice to see you guys. Hi. Okay, everybody here. And uh, just take a minute to think through uh, listening to and connecting with the Shakyamuni Buddha mantra, may it awaken the seed for my own development. And may that very development lead to happiness for both myself and others exponentially. So um, last week we were talking about um, dispositions from the sutra perspective, and this week we're going to be talking about dispositions from the tantra perspective. And um, before we do that, I think that it's, um, it's important that we don't lose some of the basic things that we know about how the mind functions and the clear light nature of the mind. So before we go into dispositions from a tantric perspective, if you can turn to page 71 in your main text, where it says common questions and debates, page 71. And you'll see on page 70, just right next door to it, is a very simple clarity of mind meditation that all of us have done many times. Um, but in case you're ever wanting to lead yourself through it and walk yourself through it, um, here are the main steps. Um, or if you're wanting to lead someone else in it. So this is a very simple clarity of mind meditation um, on page 70. And it might come in handy, especially uh, right now if you're looking after people who are having heightened stress and um, they need additional supports besides the normal ones and they're feeling kind of open to meditation. Um, it's a good one for beginners. It's also a really good one um, for us to come back to what we already know, which is the thoughts arise and dissolve. We don't have to believe them. Yes. <laughs> okay. okay. So um, on page 71, um, it's, it's from this book that I've mentioned before um, called uh, The Buddha Nature. Um, which is death, eternal soul in Buddhism. And um, there's a, a link at the end of this handout of how to find it on Internet Archive if you want to get it from the Internet Archive Library. And so we're, I'm just going to read um, this section to you guys because I think it's a really good way to clarify what we understand about the clear light nature of the mind. And then uh, if it reminds you of questions you've been having, um, we can have a bit of a discussion about it before we move on to the tantric presentation of disposition. So um, Dr. Peter Michel um, says in France last year, you said clear light should not be confused with a creator concept such as Brahman. His Holiness had said, the tantric tradition explains the Dharmakaya through the concept of clear light or the true nature of the mind. This means that all phenomena, samsara and nirvana, manifest from this clear and shining source. Therefore, one can say that this highest source, the clear light, is close to the concept of a creator. 
but one should be careful. When I speak about a source, it should not be misunderstood. I do not mean that somewhere a form of concentrated clear light exists as a substrate, similar to the non-Buddhist idea of Brahma or God. This shining space must not be deified. The question is, if this holds true, how is the clear light, which is the essence of the individual being, connected to the limited personality of this being? So this is a normal question that might come up for us or um, a question we could allow ourselves to have now that it's here in front of us. It's a good question. Um, and His Holiness responds, if you investigate and try to find out where this clear light mind is, you will be able to find it only within an individual person. For example, we speak about human beings, they are born. This means each human being is born as an individual and has his own experience of birth. At the same time, however, we can speak of human beings collectively. The same goes for consciousness. What we identify as the clear light always belongs to an individual. It is not Brahman or universal soul. Since each individual's future and present experiences are based on that clear light, it is appropriate to say that the clear light acts almost like a creator. This does not mean that a separate, isolated, universal clear light exists somewhere. Question, can the clear light be seen as something active? His Holiness, no. In our normal states, we cannot call clear light active. Through meditation or training, however, once we intentionally experience the manifestation of clear light, it can be used for perceiving or realizing objects. Perhaps at that particular point, you could call the clear light mind active. Question, does the clear light exist as a potential in every living being? His Holiness says, no, it is always there. You can compare it with water. When water is muddy, the pure water is still there. But because the water is mixed with dirty substances, you cannot identify it. If the pure water were not there, the muddy water could not exist. The existence of the dirty water itself proves that pure water is its basis. At this moment, the clear light is inactive, but it exists. Because clear light is there, the different states of consciousness and constituent factors can arise. Question. My main difficulty with this philosophy is understanding how the clear light can become unknown. How can a living being forget its Buddha nature if it is always there? His Holiness says, our everyday consciousness is on a very gross level. When we think, I say this, I know that, we are referring to a very gross level of consciousness. All the thoughts are on such a level. At present, the gross levels of consciousness is inactive and the clear light level is innate. When the clear light becomes inactive, the gross level becomes inactive. For this reason, when we are in a deep, dreamless state, we are not aware of it, although we experience it. If we have a clear dream, we can remember dreaming this or that the next day. After sleeping deeply without dreaming, we wake the next morning, feeling hardly any time has passed. We sleep soundly, and after waking, look at our watch and see that several hours have passed, but it feels like just a moment. This shows that our minds has different levels. Question, how can Buddha consciousness, which exists from the very beginning, fall into a state in which it forgets itself? For example, a Buddha was not a Buddha from the very beginning. He developed, thus there was only a seed at the beginning has the seed an evolutionary force in it? His Holiness says, no. This seed has existed as long as consciousness has existed. Consciousness has no beginning. Life has no beginning. Question, how does a person become a Buddha if there is no beginning? Do we have the wrong sense of time here? His Holiness says, one becomes a Buddha through transformation of the mind. However, you do not have to transform the clear light mind, it is already there. Question, we have to transform the unclear mind into the clear mind? Is that how it can be expressed? Is it like changing the dirty water to clean water? How does this happen? His Holiness responds, through purification by removing ignorance. 
Question. That makes sense, but how did the clean water become dirty in the first place? His Holiness says, the clear light mind becomes shrouded or unclear because of our inborn ignorance, which also exists since beginningless time. The concept of beginningless mind or of beings living since beginningless time cannot be proven directly by itself. We must, we must look at it the other way around. If you accept the beginning of living beings, then the question is, how did this begin? What was the cause? The assumptions of a beginning gives rise to a number of contradictions. Question, does the quotation from the Pali Canon at the beginning of our interview about something unborn, uncreated, and unmade refer to the clear light mind? His Holiness says, no. There, Buddha is teaching the non-self or selflessness of person meaning the non-existence of an absolute, independent self. He is referring to emptiness and not to selflessness in the sense of not being selfish. The Pali Sutras of the Theravada and the Sanskrit Sutras of the Mahayana always refer to emptiness as an unborn, unabiding, unceasing. These all relate to non-self or selflessness. In Tantra, the subtle mind of clear light is also called unborn and uncreated. Even on the conventional level, there is a good reason for doing so, as this mind is without beginning. However, this is an exception. Generally speaking, when one talks about a phenomena that arises and ceases as being free of arising and cessation, one is referring to the ultimate mode of existence of that phenomena, its non-self. There is no other way of interpreting this. Okay, so, so there's a lot to sit with there. And this particular reading um, would be something very useful to sit with very slowly. Read one of the questions and see if that's a question that you could come to yourself. Read His Holiness's response and see if it, it touches you or if it leads to even more elaborate doubts because doubt is the gateway to wisdom. So if we just leave things in a vague ambiguity we don't really go anywhere with our knowledge. It just stays as an intellectual exercise. So what we want to do is to actually encourage doubt, encourage questions, and kind of um, sharpen the horns of the dilemma. Um, it's a really important piece. We don't want to be passive about our intellectual understanding. Um, and you know, we need our intellectual understanding somewhat clear before you can even have a doubt. Otherwise, it's just kind of a combination of intellectual confusion, not sure about information, together about doubts and qualms, and it's all mixed up together. And so if you can kind of tidy up, what do I understand? What do I not understand? And then what do I believe? And what do I not believe? As two separate projects um, can be really useful. So. Um, so I would really encourage you to go back over this section a couple of times and just sit with it and um, see what comes up for you. But if there's anything that came up right away, um, you're very welcome to ask or um, add or anything. Do you have questions that come up right away or do you need to sit with it a bit longer? Sit with it. So um, I sent you the handout that's on page 40 um, in an email um, an hour ago or so, if that's easier. But on page 40 is this chart. So it's really uh, good if you can have it in front of you. This is a chart on what are called the five Dhyani Buddhas. Um, Dhyana is an old fashioned word um, that uh, early Western Buddhists came up with that's kind of like pigeoned Sanskrit. So it's actually not a word that Tibetan Buddhists use or that Indian Buddhists use. It's kind of a um, Ingiified or Westernified word, dhyani. You know, the word dhyana is referring to different kinds of meditation and things. So um, just know that dhyani Buddhas is a, is a Western way of describing this teaching. Um, a better translation is the five Buddha families. The five Buddha families or the five Buddha lineages. Um, is probably a better translation for the word. 
Yeah, but it's important to say the word Diani because if you're reading other things, you're going to keep seeing this word pop up all over the place and you want to know what it's referring to. Okay, so Tantra um, is, is so interesting because it rides on the assumption that um, there is perfection accessible in the middle of afflictions that there is paradise in amongst the most chaotic of, of environments, that, um, in, that samsara and nirvana are in a way abiding simultaneously. And um, the question is, which one are we identifying with and in? And by which one we identify with and in is what then manifests internally and externally. So it's, it's not advised to actually practice Tantra unless you're a Buddhist. You can explore some ideas about Tantra um, being not Buddhist, but to actually do the practices, um, it's very important to have direct specific guidance of someone who knows how to do it, number one. But two, if you don't have renunciation and bodhicitta, then you can be doing these practices for worldly reasons and it becomes kind of like a form of spiritual entertainment. And you can kind of get lost in the interesting energetic experiences that arise from Tantra and get yourself even more firmly rooted in samsara. So you can basically take this like wonderful medicine and turn it into poison for yourself um, if you practice it without a basis. But the ideas without the practice, just the ideas I think are very useful for anyone you know, Buddhist or not, spiritual or not, just the kind of concept that every trait has two sides. Um, I think that's not a unique concept, is it? Every trait has two sides. There's an afflicted aspect and there's an enlightened aspect. There's something neurotic, there's something wise. And, you know, if we can kind of isolate the energy that is kind of the neutral center of that, then we can consciously tip it to the direction that we want. So that's just kind of the disclaimer for Tantra. But um, when we're looking at the five Buddha families, what we're looking at is that all of us have kind of a go-to affliction. Yeah, when we're tired, when we're hungry, when we're feeling some discomfort, whatever, um, we have a go-to affliction. And then all the other afflictions also arise, but we all have kind of a favorite, for lack of a better word. Right? Some people, when they're tired, immediately become irritable and grumpy. Some people, when they're tired, immediately become needy right? and craving. Right? So it's, it's kind of um, not saying this is good or bad. It's just know yourself, because then it'll be easier to practice. Does that make sense? So similarly, when we were talking in the sutra tradition about the different dispositions, um, these are the results of habit. Right? They're not like something innate. It's not like we're inherently one of these families. It's that through the course of time and habit, we've gotten a certain habituation with a style of being. And that style of being is workable, whatever style it is. Are you with me so far? Okay. So um, if you look at your chart, the first family is called the Vajra family. And this is about the transformation of anger. So if someone who is uh, kind of naturally angry or their default affliction is anger, when they're not angry, what is the flip side of that that is still a similar energy? And so you kind of think about like, what is anger like? What is anger like? Let's sort of make anger a bit like water. Yeah, let's imagine that it's water that's boiling or it's water that's freezing depending if you're passive aggressive or aggressive aggressive. Let's just call anger like water. And what if the water is not boiling and is not freezing, then what is it? It's perfectly reflective, it's like a mirror, right? And it's able to um, be very analytically sharp about this is what I see and observe and know. Yeah, so anger has a very analytic quality, doesn't it? It just turns in on itself. When you're very angry, you have a lot to say to yourself or to someone else. Do you agree? Like that's kind of one of the qualities of anger is it has a lot to say, it has a lot to justify, it has a lot to analyze. Even if that's distorted and incorrect, it's, it's a very 
analytical kind of affliction, right? As opposed to ignorance, which is a bit kind of vague, right? So if you think about, it's just a trait, right? It's just a trait. What if I let the water melt from freezing or relax from boiling? Then just that kind of go-to elemental quality is present and it's able to reflect like life clearly and it's called mirror-like wisdom. Mirror-like wisdom. And you know, knowing each of these families is a good tool for self-awareness, but it's also a good tool for when we see people who respond to stress differently to us. It's, it's a good kind of background knowledge to be able to bring out the wisdom aspect of them. Yeah, um, you know, we could call this like Buddhist personality types, you know, um, it's, it's kind of like knowing that uh, you respond in this way can make you frustrated at people that respond a different way. But if you know yourself and you know them, then it's not a frustration, it becomes more of a, an exercise of bringing out the enlightened aspect of every response. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, um, you know, so there's a lot of things in this chart because this was a chart I made for, um, you know, card carrying Buddhists. Um, so some of the information in the chart might not be interesting to you or relevant, like the name of the Buddha family head or the hand implement that represents them. But I think that um, the basics of it transforms the energy of anger into mirror like wisdom and mainly purifies the consciousness aggregate. Right, because each of these five Buddha families is related to one of the five aggregates. Um, it's interesting to know that it's associated with a time of day and with um, a season. It's just kind of interesting um, because it can also kind of help us understand why seasonally different afflictions are more present or at different times of day are kind of like a chapter where a certain affliction has more of an opening. It's not like it's always or necessarily, but it's just kind of interesting to explore. So um, they say anger has um, kind of a wintry quality and um, is more easily present at dawn. Similarly, mirror-like wisdom. So in the morning, you know, if you haven't had a bad night, if you haven't been awoken abruptly, the mind can be very clear and spacious if it wakes at dawn. There can be a real stillness and a clarity at dawn. And if you haven't been woken in the right way, at dawn you can wake up just angry and grumpy, right? Wrong side of the bed, just angry and grumpy. Similarly with winter, winter can be this time where your analytic abilities can become uh, poetic, where you can become uh, an amazing writer, uh, an investigator of life you know you can be writing in all sorts of papers or essays because it's a time to kind of like go inward and focus in and get the job done and winter is the time where um, people can get cabin fever and kill each other because they're stuck at home all day right it's like it could go either way right um, you maybe understand cabin fever better now <laughs> not being in a cold country where you have the super winters like i have in montana um, now you're starting to understand this concept of cabin fever. Yeah, <laughs> you're like, I love all of you, but somehow also want to kill you. Weird, right? <laughs> yeah, can happen. Okay, so, so questions about the, this Vajra family first, or the whole premise before I go into each, each of them in depth. Do you, do you have questions about like the premise? Or it's something that it reminds you of, or you can relate it to? Too soon? Too soon, okay, maybe Wednesday. All right, so um, moving on to the Lotus family. Um, this transforms the energy of attachment into the wisdom of discernment. And it's related to fire, okay? And so uh, this is something very interesting for us to explore about attachment. It's fire-like nature. Because what fire does is that it illuminates things and brings light to them but it also burns them up and destroys them and is hungry. Fire, you know, fire when it's in the attachment side, it's like um, as long as you give it fuel, it will burn and burn and burn. And what is the fuel we give it? It's like obsessive thoughts. 
Yeah, so you can keep desire, you can keep attachment, you can keep these things going if you keep feeding them fuel. If you stop feeding them fuel, they will die a natural death. You don't have to pour a bucket of water on them. That, that's a quick way, right? A very quick way to get rid of your attachment is to get angry, right? But um, there, you can also be a little bit more skillful and just rob the attachment of its fuel. Yeah, you can rob the attachment of its fuel, the main fuel being obsessive thinking, repetitive thinking, yeah. Um, so when attachment isn't afflicted, but it's still this sort of fiery energy, it illuminates, it makes things bright and obvious, like fire can brighten up a room, and it becomes this wisdom of discernment, yeah? Or, um, you know, purifying the aggregate of discrimination or recognition. So we have this ability to differentiate between things, don't we? We have an ability to say, this is something healthy, this is something unhealthy, and uh, you know, this is something that will help bring happiness, this is something that won't. We have this ability already, but when attachment gets under sort of the, the skin of it, then those same abilities to discern are colored. Yeah, so it could be, this is something that gives me happiness, and it's a condition for happiness, but attachment says it's not a condition, it's a cause, right? So it takes what it's discerned or recognized and then distorts it with the afflicted energy. Yeah, so it takes something that is true in one sense and then blows up the truth and makes it actually into something that's a lie with a grain of truth in it. So if we can notice, um, if we're really wanting something or really wanting to be separated from something. If we're having a real like pulling towards energy, I want more of this or more of them or more of this, or I can't bear this, this must get away from me, they must get away from me, this must get away from me. If we're having a really escalated push and pull feeling, there is some sort of um, exaggeration present. And it's hard to let go of the exaggeration because in the center of it, is usually an accurate observation. There is something true in there, and then you've blown it up. Do, do you know what I mean, right? So if you can notice if there's like this push and pull, you know, really pull or really push, but there's an agitation in the mind, you know it's, it's moved from uh, the wisdom of discrimination into attachment. And so instead of saying to yourself, bad, don't have attachment, you don't need to do that. You can say, what is this bringing light to? What, what am I observing here that is an accurate thing that is useful in my life? Why don't I just zero in on that and hold it and then consciously try not to fuel the attachment element and let it settle and subside? Does this sort of make sense? Yeah, this, this way of describing things and you know, it's said that like attachment is more um, easily present in the summertime, you know, taking a lover in the summertime, right? Or being um, full of attachment thinking towards the evening, getting kind of uh, romantic about people, about art, about activities, just kind of getting a kind of a hungry, needy, craving sort of a chapter in the day is more likely around sunset, isn't it? Not always, not forever, right? But just if we were to break up the day in terms of chapters of afflictions, right? You're grumpy in the morning and you're attached at night. It, it happens, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, questions about the Lotus family or, or ideas about it? Why this is a Lotus? What is the... Um, these are the more um, uh, card-carrying Buddhist details of the teaching, which um, may or may not be useful for you guys. They may be just interesting knowledge about um, what Tibetan art symbolizes. And so lotus flowers are perfect and pure and uh, clean, but they are born from mud, which is sort of disgusting, heavy, you know, desirous, craving, obsession, attachment can still give birth to a perfect pure lotus flower with no mud on its petals. Yeah, um, the, the 
hand implement of the Vajra family is a Dorje or a Vajra, which is, I have, some, I have one somewhere, um, but basically it means diamond-like or indestructible. So each of the hand implements are a reference for us to kind of know what's being referred to in a certain practice or in Tibetan art. Um, and so in uh, tantric iconography, like for example, there's um, Tara behind me. In her, um, in her hair, in her top knot at the top of her head and with all Buddhas, there's usually like a little golden um, knob, a little golden knob at the top of their crown. And then if the tanka painter is um, very elaborate, there's an extra Buddha up there on their crown. And that indicates either the little knob or the actual Buddha indicates which Buddha family that Buddha belongs to and what uh, particular energy that practice transforms. So, so Tara, you know, she's green. You would think she belongs to this karma family, but actually in her top knot, she has a tiny little Amitabha, which shows that um, her main energy is transforming attachment. Yeah, so, um, so it's kind of, um, it's useful if you're, if you're looking at this like seemingly Tibetan art, just things that are there to be pretty or to be Indian or to be Tibetan, that actually every single piece of one of these paintings is a teaching tool and is indicating a way of practice. So nothing is uh, accidental, um, you know, in the core of the painting. Sometimes there's extra clouds and extra flowers just because it's pretty, but the main core of the picture is a teaching tool and a practice advice. So if you know the, the background of every aspect of the picture, you can do the practice very easily. Um, but most of the practice manuals describe the different features and what they mean. And you come to associate the image with the teachings that you've had. And um, this is this unique feature of Tantra where you're using all of your senses to work with you rather than against you. You know, in a normal meditation, most of our distractions are sensory. You know, we're hearing something or we're seeing something in our mind's eye or whatever. If you can um, marry up each of your senses with an, a meditative aspect, it can make concentration a lot easier. It's like a, a multitasking meditation and we're already good multitaskers. Um, there is someone cutting down a tree outside my door. So if you hear an odd noise, <laughs> that's what that is. They've chosen to do it now. <laughs> So, uh, so this is, it's just an interesting kind of thing to explore a little bit. For us, or at least today, the main thing I want you to understand is the affliction and the wisdom. Yeah, which affliction and what's its flip side? You know, what's kind of like its energetic essence? When is it healthy? When has it gone unhealthy? Because I think that's, that's the place where we can start to look within ourselves and look within our friends and family and patients, etc., and ask what is now going to be useful given this observation. Um, yeah, what do you think? Okay. The Jewel family, um, this is related to pride. So do you remember Minds and Mental Factors with Venerable Sangha Kadro and how she described pride as a looking down on or like a puffed up attitude that's looking down? So, um, so you're up here and those that you're proud and arrogant over are down here. Um, the flip side of that is the wisdom of equanimity. So this ability to then flatten the playing field and see the equality of everyone. So it's not like immeasurable equanimity with unbiased goodwill towards friend, enemy, stranger. It's more like the wisdom of equality that evens out and realizes that um, there is always something that the other person knows that I don't know. Yeah, even, you know, even a tiny little ant knows how to carry whatever three or nine times more than its body weight. That's something it can do that I can't do. Every single being knows something that I don't know. Therefore, pride is irrational as well as unhealthy and not useful. It's also irrational, right? So it's got an earth-like quality. So it's like when, when it's pride, it kind of, you know, crescendos up into a mountain and you're at the top looking down. When it's wisdom, it evens out and becomes this flat basis where you can see everything clearly in 360 degrees. Yeah, so it's the same energy, right? It's the same energy. It's earth-like energy 
when you're really proud, it's like, it's like a granite rock of superiority, right? It's got a hardness to it and a certainty to it. Yeah, it's very earth-like. Um, you are looking down from on high. When you have the wisdom of equality, it's got this real expansive ability to see, um, to see everyone and kind of all of their aspects. Yeah, you know when you're in an equanimous mood and you're really able to balance your thinking towards people? Yeah. So the karma family um, is about jealousy transforming into swift wisdom. And when jealousy transforms into swift wisdom, it's still got that same comparative aspect. So jealousy is comparing things. Jealousy is going back and forth and back and forth. And it's saying, um, why do they have that? I should have that. Why do they get this? I should have that. And it's comparing, you know, why can't I? Why do they? Why can't I? Why do they? And it's got a lot of back and forth moving wind energy. Yeah, but when that is in its enlightened aspect, it becomes like efficiency. Yeah, it becomes swift efficiency. It begins the ability to compare between things and then act as a basis of it. So, so similarly, Tara is related a little bit to the Amoga City family, although she belongs to the Amitabha family. Um, and it's indicated by her green color and her one foot out, ready to leap to the aid of all sentient beings. So every practice is related to one of these Buddha families, um, and some of them are kind of related to two. It depends on the practice that you're looking at. And uh, for people that are kind of hardcore into Tantra, they probably have like their one main practice that's, you know, related to an affliction that they're really working on. But then they might have other practices that, you know, kind of get the job done about other afflictions, turning them into the enlightened aspect as well. Yeah. So jealousy is an interesting one to explore, this wind quality. Because when this wind quality, this swiftness, this energeticness gets into a jealousy dichotomy, the back and forth exhausts us and we actually become less efficient. We could become more busy, but less efficient. Yeah, because it also has this edge of how will people think of me? What will people think of me? I need to manage everything. So it's got kind of a, a manipulative, I need to manage everything quality because I need to be seen in a certain way. When it's not afflicted, then it's able to manage everything by remembering, you know, multi-dimensional needs, you know, like the kids need to be fed, but they also need to go outside and go for a walk. And they also need to hang out with their friends in some way, or they're going to get lonely. You know, it's kind of multi-dimensional managing, not just what do I need to do to get them off my back? Or what do I need to do to get them to appreciate me? You know, it becomes less neurotic and it becomes more expansive. And this swift quality then works for you rather than against you. Yeah. Is that one clear enough? Yes, wind, jealousy, swift action. Okay. So then the, the last Buddha family is called um, the Buddha family or the Tathagata family. And this is related to ignorance. So, you know, this one is really, um, all of us can get into this because all of us have innate ignorance, but it's more about um, if your go-to affliction is ignorance, it means that when you're stressed out, you blank out, right? You can get the paralysis of overwhelm. Do you know this one, the paralysis of overwhelm, where you have, you're overwhelmed by needing to do so many things and remember so many things that you just kind of freeze and can't do anything? Yeah, this is related to ignorance. You become just completely stiff and can't do anything. And it's this difference that I sometimes reference in meditation of if it's enlightened, it's spacious. If it's neurotic, it's spacey. Yeah? If it's enlightened, it's expansive. If it's neurotic, it's vague. So they both have a quality of space, right? But it's how the space is used, yeah? So if you're trying to like look at your own version of this, this is what we're trying to look at is when you get into um, a spacious mindset, when is it the enlightened version that's able to hold everything with a real flexibility, with a real clarity and lightness? 
as opposed to those times when you're sort of overwhelmed by everything and you vague out and you can't even see what's in front of you because you're so overwhelmed. Do you know? So it's, it's quite interesting, these ones. They're, there's something that I think um, it, for me has been a very useful way of framing when conflict happens. Um, when I'm having some sort of conflict with another person, it usually boils down to, I'm assuming that they operate in a similar way to me and they're operating in a different way. And that's why I'm confused and that's why there's conflict. And so if I can then notice, oh, they're being in a more Vajra family type or they're being in a more or um, Lotus family type or whatever it is, then I can remember when I'm like that and empathy flows really easily. Right. It, it kind of, it, it, but if you're trying to squeeze the way they're acting into your framework, it sometimes just doesn't work. It does it. So if you kind of have this kind of idea of these five different frameworks, then when there's a bit of um, communication dissonance, when there's misunderstandings, it can be um, a nice way to step back and ask what, what's driving them. And then how can I bring out the enlightened aspect as opposed to the neurotic aspect? So questions? Can you say something about the pictures next to each family? Yeah, the pictures. The pictures are um, depicting the head of that Buddha family. So if you were to see that Buddha above the crown of another Buddha, it would be indicating what practice it belongs to. So the Vajra family picture, that's Akshobhya. The Lotus family picture, that's Amitabha. The Jewel family picture, that's Ratnasambhava. The Karma family, that's Amoga City. And the Buddha family, that's Virachana. And what you'll find is that um, most highest yoga tantra deities and other tantric yoga deities, they have their primary one at the crown of their head, but then they also have a crown that has five aspects. And it's showing that they are emphasizing one type of practice, but holding all five. Yeah, so like with Tara, she, um, she has a crown um, and she has an Amitabha. So she belongs to the Amitabha Lotus Buddha family. She's transforming attachment into the wisdom of discernment. And she's able to do everything else, but it's incidentally, it's less emphasized, right? It's just like for us in a sutra level, if we're developing compassion, it's not like it's divorced from developing love, is it? So we could be emphasizing wanting to free people from suffering, but in the background is, and I would like them to have happiness, you know, but, but if you're focusing on relief of suffering, there are particular techniques related to that. And if you try and mush all good qualities in together, it loses efficiency and power, even though eventually you want all of those to be integrated within one person. So a fully enlightened Buddha has all five of these in perfect balance. And then they manifest one type or the other, depending on what we need. So then for us as a practitioner, similarly, it's like we all have all five of these afflictions and all five of these wisdoms. What do the people in front of us need? What version? Yeah. So even though you might have your primary type, you can make use of all of the types. Does that make sense? So Tibetan art, now maybe will start to make more sense. You know, you see the five colors everywhere. Yeah, you see the five colors everywhere in Tibetan Buddhism. And the five colors are related to the five elements, related to the five aggregates, related to the five families, which are related to the, <laughs> the five wisdoms and the five afflictions, right? It's all these five are everywhere, not accidentally, not just because they're color addicts, right? Um, so then it's basically anytime we see the five colors, we're reminded, may I integrate and transform all of my afflictions into wisdoms. You know, you'll see prayer flags at some hippie friend's house in five colors and suddenly they have the significance you didn't realize. Yeah. Um, so, so Tibetan art is um, always a teaching tool and it's always a practice, um, a practice point. 
and it's pretty, but the main point isn't the pretty. The main point is they're like teaching tools. Yeah, and so um, if you can associate an image with intellectual ideas, it nourishes a different part of your mind, doesn't it? Yeah. And if you can associate um, a sound with a certain intellectual understanding, that nourishes another aspect. Um, if you can associate um, a certain physicality, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, so tantra is very elaborate, um, but it keeps boiling down to the same five basic ideas. Yeah, that you have these same five basic afflictions that can be transformed into these five wisdoms. There are peaceful ways to do that. There are um, wrathful ways to do that. There are all sorts of ways to do that, but all of the practices boil down to one of these five styles. And then in a way, uh, it feels like the, the Tantra enables us uh, to live more fully uh, also in the samsaric world. If you uh, keep the, like the, uh, you know, the, the middle point, yeah, or yeah. the right uh, energy. And not just saying it's uh, an illusion, or it's a uh, delusion and, and you know, uh, you should uh, dismiss it or leave it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it's, it's said that like, for example, take the Vajra family. If you wanted to do practices related to the Vajra family to transform your anger into mirror-like wisdom, you can't really do that unless you know how to apply the antidotes to anger and can do that. Otherwise, you're taking like the energy of anger and thinking that you can transform it when in fact you're lying to yourself, right? So it's like you need the preliminary sutra technique of if anger is present, I've got a few options. I can meditate on patience, I can meditate on loving kindness, I can meditate on emptiness, or I can watch the breath until it settles. You know, if anger is present, I've got options and I have a degree of workability with those options if I apply them. And if you don't have that and you go immediately to, oh, I'm transforming it into wisdom, then you can become a nutcase. And it happens all the time um, where people think that they're better practitioners than they are because they intellectually understand the concept, but emotionally they haven't walked themselves through the steps from the beginning. And because they haven't walked themselves through that territory, they begin work that is of transformation type, but because they don't know how to antidote, it becomes distorted and egocentric and, and can be quite bizarre. And a lot of these practices involve, um, you know, use of your subtle physical energy system, which if you don't know how to regulate, you know, kind of at least some levels of anxiety and stress, if you don't know how to self-regulate in an ordinary way, if you bring in this whole other technique that's working with the subtle energy system, you can like blow a fuse, right? You can, um, you know, start having all sorts of blissful, interesting chakra opening experiences, and it's just interesting, or you can trigger um, a psychotic break. You know, it can go either way. For a lot of people, it's just kind of something cool and interesting and blissful happens and that makes them feel interested and entertained, um, you know. And for some people, it gets really distorted and imploded because they don't know the basics first. So, so that's why practice is a little bit something you want to approach delicately. But in terms of just thought exercises, absolutely it's relevant for anyone. You don't have to be Buddhist, you don't have to be religious or spiritual or anything. You could just be a ethical atheist and use these ideas and it could be quite useful for sure just use these ideas in your daily life and i think that it can be really powerful because it's also saying you don't have to change you just want to flick from the dark side to the light side right it just needs that you need to flick over into the other aspect of the energy there's nothing wrong with your energy yeah do you know what i mean Right, so, so in a way it can be quite empowering to say, whatever your afflictive style is, is going to be your place of power, actually. 
yeah rather than it being a fault or a deficiency or something wrong with you your go-to affliction becomes your place of power so if you're someone that is full of attachment and craving and neediness and obsessions and desires that's no longer a problem it's just an interesting place to pivot from and work with it's a place of self-knowing and so you go oh the fire is wanting to eat everything let's just turn it into light shall we you know <laughs> in the back of your mind there's a little switch that flicks rather than feeling like you're suppressing something yeah it's in it's saying energy is strong why don't i use it in a dharmic way imagine if your um angriest moment your most boiling angry energetic moment where you're so angry that you're shaking what if you took out the wish to harm? What if you took out any ill will, but still had that same energetic strength and put into it loving kindness and compassion? How powerful that love would be, right? This is what Tantra is about. Because you know, if someone was boiling angry and walked into the room, their energy would radiate through the room. Everyone would feel it, even if they don't ever talk about energy or know about energy. If someone was boiling mad and walked into the room silently, you would all feel it. What if someone walked into the room with that degree of power, but it was love instead? You would feel it, right? And it would be an incredibly powerful experience that would bring out a lot of richness in you. And this is the experience that a lot of us have with meeting um, as holiness. For oh, yeah, is that? No? No. So I, I thought I, I just, uh, it really uh, gives you a way to find when you get lost, I think, to find your specific path. Like for minutes, you can, if you feel lost inside your emotions, you can find this path because it's more specific to you. Exactly. Yeah, yeah exactly. More specific to you. That's, that's exactly it. And, um, and you might notice that, you know, in some chapters of your life, one is more dominant, and then it shifts and another one is more dominant, or it could be that throughout your whole life, you're just a whatever kind of family person. You know, it's not like you need to um, overly identify. But I think it is useful to look at, um, you know, in the course of a day, is there patterns I can point to of when which when a certain affliction is dominant? Or aside from a certain kind of day, are there seasons when I notice a certain kind of affliction is dominant? Or aside from that, in my life, is there affliction that is always dominant, even if other ones come and go? That is interesting information because it all becomes a pivot point of practice, switching from afflicted to enlightened just in one second. You know, you take just the raw energy, the raw neutral energy and say, this is my place of practice and you shift to the wisdom aspect because we already have enough self-awareness to know what our rational self is and what our less rational self is. It's just about enough mindfulness and self-awareness to catch it in the moment so that you can make the switch. This, the ability to switch is something that we already have. It's just having enough mindfulness to catch it in the moment of truth where we can make this transition from afflicted to enlightened. Uh, Yontan, could you say some word about, uh, concerning uh, the differences between, uh, for example, when you're working uh, with patient again, against anger, let's put it this way, and you mentioned just here the, the anger, what a different way of practicing it between Tantra and the Sutra. I mean, I mean, I could only frame it in terms of, uh, you know, students, I guess, because I don't have, I don't have patience. But if someone is talking to me about their anger, and I'm coming from a sutra perspective, then I have conversations with them about patience and loving kindness, if they're a beginner. If they're very intelligent, and they pick up things quickly, then I talk to them about thought transformation, like the eight verses. And if they're very sharp, I talk to them about transformation. You know, so what I'm trying to do is, okay, so anger is the issue and anger is the disruptive force in their life. At what level can they hear medicine? You know, and for some, it's got to be very basic. And for some days, it's got to be very basic. But if it was a tantric uh, dispositioned person, 
what I would say instead of look, you know, normally we would say, let's look at the faults of anger and the benefits of love. If, if there's someone who's sharper than that, I would say, what is the wisdom inside of your anger? In your anger, there is a lot of fluff, there is a lot of exaggeration, there's a lot of story, but what is at the center of your anger that is actually the true thing you get to keep? You know, so you kind of zero right in and say, you're not wrong, the response is afflicted, but it doesn't mean you're wrong. Whereas from a sutra perspective, we're saying, you're wrong, <laughs> stop it, right? Um, you know, it just, it's, it's a leveling thing. It's a leveling thing. So, so if it's someone with a tantric disposition, I, instead of applying antidotes, I ask them what is true about their um, falsity? What is true about their affliction? You know, rather than saying the affliction is a problem or the affliction is wrong, I can say there is wisdom in your anger. What would you say it is? What's the accurate observation that then you're giving yourself permission to boil or freeze because of it? Because if you just notice what that observation is, it can level out into this mirror-like clarity that actually can become very logical and intelligent and effective. But yeah, it's hard to, it's hard to give an example without a person in front of me to, you know, play with. <laughs> it sounds like a deep uh, analytic interpretation. Does it? Tell me more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah if I understand what you just explained. So you're talking about levels. So it's not, a, it's, although no, there are differences in, in terms of the me, uh, methodology, uh, because you're talking about logic concerning the Tantra, although I don't understand what you're doing with it uh, afterwards. Okay, so what is the, let's say the wisdom in your anger, for example. So, Maybe in this point in psychoanalysis, you will go to a different direction, but maybe not. I don't, because I don't know what you're going to do with this. But in terms of looking into the inner reasoning, the deep inner reasoning, not, to, not looking for the antidote, but go into it, it sounds to me quite, uh, quite I wouldn't say the same, but in the same environment. Yeah, I, I think the, the relative side of it is, I, I think, you know, just guessing. So it's like you're, you're trying to bring wisdom to it by what is the relative wisdom within your affliction. And then the ultimate wisdom is always still and it's empty of inherent existence. So there's say there's this power and there's this rush of the energy of anger. You're, you're saying allow the rush allow the boiling energy of anger, and at the same time, look at how you lack inherent existence, the situation lacks inherent existence, the person who's triggering it lacks inherent existence, all of the responses, all of the conditions, et cetera, et cetera. Look with the ultimate analysis at each component of the drama and see the way that it's empty while allowing the energy to stay. And now that you've analyzed the emptiness of it, how can you, instead of ill will in the relative level, take the same information and bring loving kindness and compassion to it? And now you have, you know, just incredibly powerful love as the response to the same observation. You know, so say the observation is this person is uh, constantly critical and I'm so angry at them because they're constantly critical. Well, you can't tell them, no, they're not constantly critical because they've accurately observed that is the case. But the conclusion they're coming to is, therefore, it's destroying my life, disturbing my peace, and they are wrong, right? And that's what anger says is true. <laughs> what you're saying is all the, you know. <laughs> Sorry, did did you want to add something? Else? I wanted to say just that I think if we could take examples of each of one, of each of every one of them, we could, I think, better hold the afflictions the transformations, like I think it would be much more uh, vivical and we could argue with it and understand it deeply. Yeah. So um, maybe we can. We, uh, we have to finish, um, but uh, the reading that's related to this, I, I really hope you guys can have time to do the reading. It's on page 38 until page 41. Oh, excuse me, until page 43. It's a little, 
44. Oh, it's so long. I'm so sorry. It's a long reading, but um, if you can read it before next Monday, it's, it's very interesting and it's not like intellectually heavy. It's, a, it's an easy read. Yeah, it's, um, it's on the Five Wisdom Energies by um, Irene Rockwell. So page 38 to 44, it looks like. Yeah, 38 to 44. Look I, look, I think you'll find it really interesting. Even if you don't agree with it, I think it's really good food for thought. So if, um, if there's a reading that you can do, please do this reading because it's, um, it's really interesting. And then it'll make conversation on Wednesday more fun if you've done it. So um, yeah, if that's okay. We'll just take a minute to um, let the ideas settle a little bit and, um, and we'll, we'll revisit it on Wednesday a bit before we move on. So um, don't worry, we'll come back to it. All right, so just connect. Thanks, guys. Thank you. See you later. <laughs>